The Gospel according to Matthew, the third chapter, starting with the first verse I'm reading from the New International Version. Hear ye the word from the, of the Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make the paths straight for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when they saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff for the fire. Mm. Yeah. Or with the unquenchable fire. God's word for God's people, and God's people said amen. amen. I want to spend a little time talking to you about it is what you think. Uh, I started preparing this message, and I thought I was going to title it, It's Not What You Think. But uh, as I got deeper and deeper into the preparation, I realized that it is what you think. Amen? Amen. So there was this interview uh, by a man by the name of Bill Moore, Moyers, and he was interviewing a Robert Penn Morin, who at the time was America's Poet Laureate. And Mr. Morris, Moyers asked Mr. Warren, sir, as one of our leading writers and philosophers, can you tell me how we can resolve the terrible crises that surround us? Decaying cities, terrible health care, terrible crisis in education and housing, and so much poverty. Mr. Warren leaned forward in the interview and said, well, Bill, for a beginning... I think it would be good if we would stop lying to one another. This is it. This is all. Mm. We so desperately avoid looking at the truth mm. square on, much less saying it out loud, because it's uncomfortable for us to go about our days in relative luxury while people next door are dying for lack of shelter. Civic pride, he said, can lose its shine when reality is allowed a place at the table. I find it unspeakably hard to walk past someone whose life would be improved noticeably by the amount of spare change I could, finally, I could probably find on the floor of my car. But we manage those of us who are lucky enough to walk on by. I'm reminded of another story. Uh, someone was interviewing uh, Mother Teresa, and they said, you know, that you've inspired me, all the work that you've done, you've inspired me. I would just want to know how I can help you make a difference in the world. And Mother Teresa looked right back at him and said, wake up at four in the morning. There's going to be somebody out in the street in the cold that thinks that they don't matter. And what I want you to do is convince them that they do. Mm. 
we have to take a hard look at certain things that are going on. We have to take a hard look at ourselves. We have to take a hard look at our positions and realize that we have been lying to ourselves. We've been lying about our financial situations. We've been lying about our emotional situations. We've been lying about our status. We've been lying to other people and we've been lying to ourselves. We do not all have it going on like we think we do. We don't walk on rose petals. We have stuff going on in our lives and our stuff stinks. And so we see John the Baptist calling people out on their stuff. Uh, we're in the Advent season and we have a lot of Advent scriptures about being in preparation and waiting on the coming king. And there's things that need to happen while we are waiting on the coming king. And so John the Baptist is out here preaching. And he, this story takes place right after Jesus' birth and escape to Egypt uh, after hiding based on King Herod's order where he heard that a child was going to rise up and dethrone him. So he decided that everybody that was two years old and under needed to die, all the male children. And so they got Jesus out of that land and hid in Egypt. And I have to wonder, just a question, it's not necessarily in the sermon, but how would you be able to hide in Egypt? So anyway, we have John preaching, John the Baptist, and his message is a proclamation. It's a proclamation that says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they're telling us that uh, the scripture that was said, a voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's coming to fruition. There is a proclamation. There is a public or an official announcement, especially one dealing with a great matter of importance. There's an announcement. There's a pronouncement. There's a statement. There's a notification. There's a publication. There's a broadcast, a promulgation, a blazoning. A clear declaration of something. It's a proclamation with passion. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Repent because the kingdom of hand is at near. John the Baptist, as Josephus the historian says, he had, he had made Herod mad. And I like how I, I, when I read through the Bible and I spend time reading through the Bible and there are a bunch of stories that go on and and, and, and I like Mark because Mark is short and to the point. This entire story is covered in one verse. Mark 1 and 4 says that he is in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance. We read that before we lit the second candle today. And then you have other stories where Luke introduces them as cousins. And, and we deal the relationship. But Matthew, which they say is favorable, more favorable of the gospels to the church, doesn't talk about their relationship. It talks about what John is doing. It doesn't mention that they are cousins in Matthew. It just goes right on to what he does. And he appears abruptly to tell us that the kingdom of God is at hand. And we talk about the kingdom of God being near, but not only is the kingdom, when it's at hand, not only does it mean chronologically, but it also is a physical representation. We're looking for God to do things in our lives, and we're looking for ways to make a difference in the world, and we're looking for ways to do certain things, but there are a million things that are at arm's reach that we walk past every day. That could greatly affect the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God is, at, is near and John is here abruptly to tell us that. And he didn't dress like people dressed. He didn't eat what the people ate. He didn't do all of the same things that the people thought someone of his stature, someone who was uh, important, as important to the narrative of God's story amongst the people happened. He didn't dress like that. He wasn't born of the right family or so we would think if we were back during those times. He didn't have the right means, but here he was playing an important part in the kingdom. And they talk about the fact that he was eating locusts and wild honey. 
locusts were declared uh, uh, ritualistically clean Amen. in Leviticus. So he wasn't doing anything Amen. out of the ordinary by eating locusts. They said that it was clean, but something that was interesting about the people at that time is that the people who ate locusts at that time were poor. Hmm. So John decided that obedience to God was more important than personal comfort. Amen. Amen. John was able to cut back on what he was doing. It doesn't necessarily say that he was necessarily rich or necessarily poor, but he lived a particular way because obedience to God was important. Right. Are we willing to give up some of our own creature comforts to be obedient to God? And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about talent. I'm talking about your mindset. Are we willing to be uncomfortable, to be, to be obedient to God? They say he was modeling like Elijah who did the same thing, gave up creature comforts to do what God had ordered him to do. And so we have a proclamation but we also have a prediction. And that prediction is Isaiah the prophet saying that this was going to happen over 700 years ago. There's an adage that says that in the New Testament, Jesus is revealed, but in the Old Testament, Jesus is concealed. And so when you go through a lot of these Old Testament verses, you will see these people looking for a Messiah. And they're saying that the Messiah is going to be doing this and the Messiah is going to be born in this place and he's going to be from this town. And he's going to be doing all of these things. And Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies. But one of those prophecies, Isaiah says 700 years before the, the verse that I read in your hearing, he said that there was going to be a voice of somebody crying out in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord. He said that 700 years ago and then 700 years later, John the Baptist comes along and he goes out into the wilderness and says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Repent, the kingdom of God is near. And so he's got this prediction and his prediction has come to pass. And the mantle has, he's wearing a garment of camel hair and a leather belt and eating locusts and wild honey. And I say that to say that some people won't look like you think they are going to look. Some people won't act like you think they're supposed to act. They won't have the amount of education that you think they're supposed to have. They may not have the level of experience that you think they're supposed to have. But if we're going to let God be God, we have to accept that God will raise up a different kind of leader. John is the one who the prophet Isaiah spoke about. and He's saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He's coming to make the crooked paths straight. And so we have what John preaches. And then we have to whom John is preaching. Uh, the text says in verses 5 and 6 that people went all about him from Jerusalem and Judea and the whole region unto the Jordan. There were the people of Israel. Many accepted what he had to say, and they were baptized. This baptism was an outward expression of an inward commitment. See, prior to that, they had ritualistic washings. But uh, those ritualistic washings from the Mosaic law had to be repeated over and over again. But this baptism once was enough. Mm. All right. Once was enough. Why? Because God was doing the work. Mm. If you needed to be baptized twice, you were saying that God didn't do the work the first time. Mm. We don't save ourselves. I know the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You're confessing, but God is still doing the saving. I know that the word says for God so, ever, uh, God so loved the world that he forgave his only, he, beget, he sent his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You're believing in him, but God's still doing the saving. The Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're calling on the name of the Lord, but God is still doing the work. Right. That is a core Methodist belief. 
They won't let me in the pulpit if I don't believe this. God does the work. God does all the work. I remember being at the Texas Annual Conference last year and they were talking about the remember your baptism and I thought about it. Everybody laughed about it because they asked why are certain certain people Methodists and one person on the video said I'm Methodist because my baptism stuck. Hmm. So this is not a repeated thing. This is to show this inward commitment, but God is still doing the work. And so these people of Israel are getting baptized to show their inward commitment outwardly. But God's grace is for all. And so they're preaching to the people of Israel. And then they're also preaching to the religious leaders of Israel. Right around verse 7, it says, "Where the, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, and he was where he was baptized, and he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Ah, uh, he's calling them brood of vipers. Literally, in the text, it's described a son of snakes. Mm. And you know what I've learned about snakes? And I found interesting in preparing for this text. I knew it, but I never put two and two together. A snake's mouth is full of poison. How many of us know somebody whose mouth may be full of poison? Mm. And if you don't know anybody else whose mouth may be full of poison, you might be the one. Mm. All right. And I'm not talking about just saying evil things like you don't like somebody or you don't care for somebody. The poison can be you can't do it. Mm. Mm. The poison can be I can't help you. The poison can be, I don't think that person should be in that position. Our mouths are used to frame our worlds. What kind of world are you framing? Are you framing one to build up? Or are you framing one to tear down? And so he warns them to repent and do good works or be destroyed. Uh, we say repentance a lot, but we don't. I think sometimes we say it just to be saying it. Repentance is the complete reorientation of one's entire being toward God and turning away from anything that hinders wholehearted devotion to God's will. It is literally changing the way you think about something. A reorientation, that's an act of figuring out again where you are in your relationship to your environment or changing directions. If you're, if you're lost in the woods, a compass and a map could be used to reorient yourself. It's related to your, your location. And so when you are repenting, you are reorienting yourself. You are putting yourself back on the right direction for God. Even in the Old Testament, when they talk about re, uh, repentance, it's about a change of direction and getting back into covenant. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is not just saying, oh, my bad, I'm not going to do that again. Bro, you have to change the way you think about it. Right. If you say you repented, but you still want it, and you still like it, and you still spend the time pursuing it, you have not really repented. One of the first things Jesus said in Luke round about chapter 5 when he started speaking, he said that he came not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners to repentance. We have to change the way we think about things. They say that in the, one of the definitions of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If you keep on doing the same old things, you can't complain about getting the same old results. If you want to move from glory to glory and faith to faith, you have to change the way you think about it. Change the way you think about your prayer life. Change the way you think about your giving. Change the way you think about your volunteering. Change the way you think about some of the other church folk you work with. All right. Change the way you think. 
And then the text goes on to say when he talks to these, these Pharisees and Sadducees and he tells them to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. There should be fruit. There should be something visibly shown. There should be a change in what you're doing and how you go about it. Or else it's not true repentance. And then he says, don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Don't just think because you are in the family that everything is all right. Don't just think because you are a third generation member of the church that it'll be all right. Don't just think because the church is 250 years old that you'll be all right. Don't just think because you think you got it going on that it will be all right. God will raise up stones and put them in a place and make them the sons of Abraham. Don't just rely on your status. Don't just rely on your daddy and your granddaddy and your mama and your grandmama's history. We have to change the way we think to move forward. And so I ask myself, why did the Pharisees and the Sadducees come? Here you have this quote-unquote unqualified person out here baptizing people and they want to see what's going on. And it came to me that judgment, the judgment coming is no respecter of person. The judgment coming does not matter who you are, does not matter how much money you've given, does not matter how much money you have in your pocket, does not matter how many letters you have in front or behind your name. Judgment is coming for all. And the standard of judgment for all is proper conduct. So we need to bear fruit worthy of repentance. I remember getting in trouble from time to time. And I would get in trouble and, and, and say to my, when I was apologize, I'd say I'm sorry. And they would say, you don't act like it. We got to act like it. Uh, and he says that the winnowing fork is coming. And, I, I, and they're talking about the threshing floor. And this is where they separate the wheat from the chaff that, that they can use to make the bread. And that, that they don't. And the winnowing fork is something that is used to separate the grain from the chaff, but it's also used to remove pests. And so they throw the, 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 the wheat in the air, and the grain comes down, but the lighter chaff blows away. So are we heavy in this faith? Are we light in this faith? Do we only spend the couple of minutes we come to hear the reading of the scripture? And is that the only time we spend in our Bible or do we spend any time in the Bible at home? Is the only time we pray when we bless the food or say, now I lay me down to sleep? Is that, or are we spending more time in prayer? How do we think about this thing that we call Christianity? And it's separated. So we need to be heavy. We need to be grounded or else we'll blow away. Or else, when trouble comes, we'll fly off. Or else, when trouble comes, we'll be out of here. God is bigger than our problems. But if we don't change the way we think, if we keep doing the same old things, we are going to continue to get the same results. So we have to change the way I th we think. The Bible says now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ever ask or think according to the power which worketh in us. We need to change the way our thinking is. How big can you imagine? If you only imagine your day-to-day -day work, then you'll keep getting the day-to-day -day stuff. If you only imagine a Jesus always being a baby every December, you won't get delivered. We have to change the way we think because God can provide above all that we could ask or think. The Bible says in Romans 12, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Again, we got to change the way we think. 
If we don't change the way we think, we're going to get the same old thing. We need to be willing to be a 1 John 5 type of God. We have to have a relationship with the 1 John 5 chapter God. What kind of relationship is that? 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, Now this is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, I hear some Bible readers, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, when we have the petitions, will be asked of him. We have to change the way we think. And not only do we have to change the way we think, we got to change the way we act. We can't just keep saying, Lord, do it for me, and then go back to the same way we've been going. If we expect God to get anything done in the kingdom, the time is up for the same old pity pat prayers. How big is your God? How big is the one that you serve? How, how big is your God to come through? Is he able to help you out? Do you really believe he's a doctor in the sick room? Do you really believe he's a lawyer in the courtroom? Or is this just the God you use to bless your food for the nourishment of your body in the hands that prepared it? Amen. We have to change the way we think. We have to change which way we're going. We have to reorient ourselves to get back with God. We can't keep asking God to do these things over and over again and then act like ain't nothing changed. And so he preaches, John is preaching for the coming Messiah. He's saying, I baptize you with water. But the one coming behind me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. If you expect to make any kind of change in your life, you are going to have to be led by the Holy Spirit. If you expect for your big God to work out and for you to change the way you act so that you can handle your big God working the problems out, you are going to need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to have to provide guidance and fire. And fire. Have you ever been touched by fire? Fire will make you move when you did not want to move. Fire will make you say some things that you did not intend to say. You may be a slow mover, but let you touch something that's hot. Oh! And so we are going to have to change the way that we think. We are going to have to change the way that we act. And we're going to have to change the way that we move. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. And he says that the axe is already at the root of the tree. We don't have that much time. If an axe is at the root of the tree, it's going to be cut down soon. If the axe is at the root of the tree, that means that tree is going to fall. So the best time to move is now. We have to change the way that we think. We have to change the way that we act. We have to change the way that we talk to people. We have to change what our priorities are. Or else we'll be out doing the same old thing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come.